Okay, hi everyone. I am very um, thrilled to be welcoming you to the very first panel of the very first day of this Aquatic Life Conference in 2022. My name is uh, Giulia Malerbi and I'm the Global Policy Lead here at the Aquatic Life Institute. As I told you, I'm really excited to be welcoming you today. Just bear with me, I need to provide a few outkeeping reminders for all of our attendees. So as you probably noticed, all the audience is muted and the camera is off by default upon entry. But there is the possibility, obviously, to post the questions, uh, all the questions that you have in the Q&A box here on Zoom. There is a specific feature. Just letting you know that for the panelists, we will answer your questions at the end uh, of all the presentations. As you probably noticed, the sessions are being recorded. And as mentioned before, here at the Aquatic Life Institute, we have a policy of absolute zero tolerance for any type of harassment and discrimination. So please keep that in mind. We would love to have respectful and productive discussions. Um, jumping a little bit more to this session, um, to the logistics, this session will last um, 45 minutes. We have uh, three speakers lined up, as well as plenty of Q&A time at the end of all their presentations. Okay, so let's start diving in a little bit more into the actual uh, panel. The title of today's panel is Small But Impactful Startups. And our goal with today's panel is to highlight the work that small but impactful startups are leading all around the world and shine a light on some of the neglected um, topics that they are covering. I will briefly introduce the panelists because I don't want to steal away their time. So we first have uh, Denise Kirak, a fish welfare program manager and Kassif Turkey. Uh, then we have Daniel Lusinke, postdoctoral research at the Institute of Agri-Food Research Technology in Spain. And last but not least, Anna Behar, member of PAXMA Board of Directors, the Animalist Party Against the Mistreatment of Animals in Spain. Okay, so Denise, um, you can start, so I'll leave the floor to you. Hi, Julia. Julia, thank you for introducing me. Um, will you be opening the presentation or should I open it myself? You can share your slides directly if you want. Okay, great. Just a second, please. Okay. Um, you should be able to see it at the moment, right? Do you see yeah. my presentation? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, so as Julia introduced me, my name is Denis and I'm working as the Fish Welfare Program Manager at Cafe Sus Turkey, uh, also known as uh, Turkey Without Cages, if you're wondering the uh, translation of our name. Um, sorry, oh, yeah. Um, so today I'm going to present you our project that is still under development. Uh, our fish welfare program started 10 months ago, and ever since then we are trying to uh, set our goals and come up with a strategy. So today I'm going to try to explain you who we are as an organization. And before explaining my project, I'm going to present the current situation and problems in Turkey regarding fish welfare. And at last, I will present you what, where are we at in our project and what have we done so far. Um, so, uh, Cafe Sis Turkey is the only organization in Turkey that is focused on cage-free egg campaigns and fish welfare. Um, this is our team, but you don't see me in the picture, actually. Um, I'm, I'm the cutout one. Uh, our strategy is uh, doing white, white uh, doing campaigns against uh, companies to co uh, convince them to commit to cage-free uh, systems. And also with our fish welfare program, we are gonna uh, prioritize corporate outreach as well, but I will be explaining it later on. Uh, so what is the situation in Turkey at the moment? I will try to explain how huge the product production in Turkey and uh, I will try to highlight the enormous amount of it. 
So the number of fish farmed in Turkey is estimated to be between one to two billion and 60%. And according to some resources, 80% of the production is being exported. So this uh, data is very important for us to, uh, to focus in a different area because the domestic market is just not enough by itself to do corporate outreach because most of the fish are actually being exported. And uh, another data is that actually the consumption of Turkish people of fish is very low. Um, so to give an example of that, uh, approximately every each person in Turkey is consuming six kilograms of fish in a year. And to compare it in European countries, it's approximately 24 kilograms. So you can see how low it is actually. So for us, uh, collaborating with international organizations and focusing on export is really important. Um, second of all, in aquaculture production, Turkey ranks 12th in the world, and uh, most farm species are European sea bass, jilted sea bream, and rainbow trout. This is why we're also focusing on this species and farmed animals at the moment in Turkey. We also have a, not a species, but a fish called Turkish salmon. It's actually brown, rainbow trout. Uh, produced and grown in inland water, but then transferred to uh, Black Sea region to be grown in offshore systems. And we, in Turkey, this is called Turkish salmon. Um, Turkey has occupied the first place in turk production, second place in sea bass and sea bream production among European countries. So our production, as you can see, is highly high. So these are the countries that we most export fish to. Um, this map is also kind of important for us to uh, see which countries we should reach out to collaborate on an international level to ask them from uh, to ask them to ask from Turkey uh, to higher their standards um, regarding fish welfare. So what are the most problematic welfare areas? Um, to, to talk about this, we need to first divide it into two different types of farms. One is for rainbow trout farms, because in rainbow trout farms, we observe mostly small and medium scale farms. And for sea bus and sea bream, 95% of the farms are big scale farms. So the welfare standards really differentiates uh, among those farms. So first, uh, we're going to focus on small and medium scale rainbow trout farms. And the problem there we see, and uh, before explaining this, I've been doing a lot of field research and visiting a lot of farms to see with my own eyes what the situation is like and what are the needs of the farmers and what is the uh, knowledge on fish welfare. So as we can imagine, lack of knowledge and expertise is one of the problems that we face. Um, just not, not just for fish welfare, but these farms mostly owned by family companies that pass from gen one generation to another. So they don't have the background on uh, anything related to fish science. So this is one of the problems we observe. Another problem is lack of auditing because most of these farms uh, doesn't have the certificates uh, which are Global Gap, ASC, and Friends of the Sea at the moment. These are the uh, certificate companies that are exist in Turkey. Uh, so most of them are not certified. Um, traditionalism is another problem that we face. Um, according to a source that I talked to, he reported me he's a he's a owner of a company that sells electrical stunning systems. So according to him, when he tried to sell his equipment to these kind of farms, um, the only reason they rejected it because they were not open to new technologies. That, that was the only reason, not the economy, not anything else, but just because they just thought that they knew the best. So the, traditionalism is a problem that we see. Another problem is disease treatment. Um, this was uh, reported by an academician that uh, it was the most problematic fish welfare aspect in those kind of farms because they did not know how to deal with those kind of diseases and they were not consulting to anyone. Stocking density is another problem. And lastly, for Turkish salmon companies, live bleeding is, uh, big, is one, of, one of the biggest problems because the buyer is Japanese companies and they mostly uh, ask for those companies to bleed their fish live. Sorry, I need to drink water. And lastly, of course, lack of humane slaughter methods. And for sea bass and sea bream, 
Um, the biggest problem I observed, and when I talked with the sector, that was the uh, also common idea. Lack of humane slaughter, slaughter methods was the uh, biggest problem. Some of the companies actually do have the uh, electrical stunning system uh, because sometimes international companies require them to use it. For example, Tesco, uh, a retailer company from UK, is demanding this machine to be used. So there are farms in Turkey that uses this system, but not most of them. And they don't use it all the time also, even though they have the system, they only use it when it's demanded. Um, also, as I mentioned, domestic market is really small. So any corporate outreach within the country is not so much of effective. That makes it very crucial for us to focus on exports and the other countries as well. And the other thing that was reported to us was the resistance from the workers towards new implementations, because even though the owner itself of the farm requests them to use the new machines and new technologies, sometimes work, work resisted against it, um, just because they were the ones who were taking risk by using a new uh, technology that they were not familiar with. Another thing that was reported was not official, uh, unofficially, was that because there are so many orders to those companies and they're really big, they sometimes cannot meet the orders. So they buy their fish from the small farms themselves, which do not have the certificates, but they are selling it under those certificate schemes. So that was what, another problem that we faced. Um, so in general, another problem is lack of community support. Not many Turkish people are aware that fish can feel pain and we should do something about it. Unfortunately, it's not a wide known knowledge, uh, especially if you compare it to European countries, we can say that it's very low. Uh, another problem is lack of Turkish literature on the subject. So I, if I have to search for anything, it should be English, but this is a problem because most of the farms and most of the Turkish people doesn't speak English. So if I want to reach out to them and raise awareness on the subject, we need to support and contribute to Turkish literature as well. Um, so here I present a, a survey done with Rainbow Trout Farms. So according to this survey, 52% of the 23 enterprises participating in the survey ignored fish welfare, and 48% of them took it into consideration. 83% of the enterprises stated that they have the potential to provide fish welfare, while 17% stated that this potential does not exist. But most importantly, 74% of the enterprises stated that there's a low possibility of them to implement a humane slaughter protocol, uh, which demonstrates us that there is a huge uh, problem there that we should focus on to promote electrical stunning system. So considering the results, the other results from the survey, it is seen that aquaculture enterprises in Turkey do not have enough opportunities, support, and information about fish welfare. As for the legal improvements, um, circular, there is a circular of wel uh, welfare on fish, uh, which is a pretty decent legal document, actually, uh, that, was uh, that was drafted in line with the European Union Council Director, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, however, this circular doesn't have any enforcement power or auditing, unfortunately. Um, so these are the pictures that I myself took uh, from my visits to farms. This is a transportation tank. Uh, as you can see from the picture itself, it lacks a lot of technology to provide fish welfare to fish. Um, this is one uh, offshore uh, cage system that, that you, the blue tanks that you see are used for really dangerous chemicals before. So therefore they are really cheap and some farms are using it for rainbow trout, especially to float the cage systems. But uh, when you visit the farms, you can see from the water that uh, it's really oily. The, the, the blue tanks are leaking some uh, oils inside them. And this is another picture I've taken um, these fish are conditioned to be fed by a single point. So even though they're not being fed at the moment, they always stuck and swim in the same area, which creates a problem. And the solution to this would be really simple, just like not feeding them from a single point. But uh, because of the lack of education, it was, the, that knowledge was not 
uh, it was, was something new to them. So these were the problems that we saw uh, and that was reported to us. So what is our strategy? First of all, we want to focus on corporate outreach. We have one commitment from a major wholesaler, Metro Markets in Turkey, that impacts 10 million fish. In that commitment letter, Metro stated that they will not buy fish from farms that doesn't have global gap, ASC, Friends of the Sea Certificate for Farms, and MSC Certificate for Fisheries. Apart from that, they require a certain amount of stocking density. Although they do not specifically say that they require electrical stunning system, they mention that they require humane slaughter methods. Um, the reason why they didn't want to uh, say electrical stunning system was because of PR uh, concerns, because the electrical stunning system itself doesn't sound very something friendly of fish welfare, right? So this was one of their concern and that was a problem that we didn't think of before. Um, so we didn't finalize our new commitment letter yet. We are updating it, but it's probably gonna focus on two things. It's gonna ask for the certificates that are present at the, at the Turkey at the moment and also for electrical stunning system according to species. Another strategy we're going to focus on is raising awareness, and we are planning to do it by contributing to Turkish literature, also uh, collaborating with uh, companies and schools. Uh, apart from that, international collaboration, as I mentioned before, is very important for us. Uh, we've been talking with a lot of NGOs who are focused on same uh, species and who are buying fish from Turkey as well to create a demand from that side also. And we want to fund a research on case study on the use of electrical stunning systems in Turkey. It's going to focus on uh, the farms that uses these systems, and it's going to focus on why they use it. And if a farm doesn't use the system, we're going to figure out why they don't use it and what will be the cost of using these uh, systems. So, so far, we were uh, focusing on that and trying to uh, come up with the best strategy we, we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, you can contact me via my uh, email or my phone or anywhere you feel comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. This was really interesting. And I was aware of the growing sector of aquaculture in Turkey, but I was not aware of the numbers of um, exports. So that's really interesting. Um, we already have some questions, but as I told you at the beginning, we will answer all of them at the end of all the presentations. So please keep posting them. And Daniel, um, over to you. Hi, uh, good morning, I think in, in USA. Um, and just a minute for share my screen. Thank you for the opportunity from uh, the Ali. Uh, um, for share this interesting thing in about the um, iconic um, species uh, from Brazil. Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Daniel Santiago Rusinki. I am from Colombia, but I live in Brazil eight years, and actually I am a postdoc uh, researcher at IRTA in Spain, uh, working with the animal welfare group in the um, uh, uh, in the research line about the human slaughter methods for farm animals. So uh, I I. Um, I like uh, always start with uh, talking about fish sentience. I know that we are here. We know that the fish field feels in the same way that the other uh, animal vertebrates. And we have a lot of literature and academical uh, knowledge about um, the behavior, needs, welfare, and other issues for improved welfare. And I will like to, to show you some, um, some data from a paper for my master's students about the perception of fish welfare sentence and uh, welfare in 
in citizens from Bogota, Colombia, and from Curitiba in Brazil. And the citizens believe that, that fish feel pains, that is great. And also they have a lot of high degree of perception uh, of suffering in handling the fish out of the water. Um, anyway, uh, we have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, regarding human slaughter concept, uh, but the most of the people uh, will be include fish in the slaughter regulations because the slaughter regulations excludes fish. And I, I would like to introduce you the Arapai Majigas. Arapai Majigas is an iconic species from the Amazon River. Um, this is present not just only in Brazil, but also in Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. And this species uh, is really relevant uh, for special markets in, in Brazil, and the production is growing any year. Um, one critical point for, for Pirarucu or for the Arapai Majigas is the weight at killing because they are a really big uh, animal, really big fish. And there is not any technology uh, for uh, human slaughter this uh, kind of fish. And also because uh, this fish is uh, the subsistence for fishermen and their families in one, specific season on the year. Uh, and the technology is just only for the farmers and it's just related with uh, 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 techniques for reproduction and breeding. And this is the way that Pirarucu is captured. Um, and after all that, the fisherman just uh, gives a um, uh, blue in the head and just put it in the in the in the ship for transport for the for processing. Um, Peruku is also a important part for sustainable program to maintain fish stocks and is being an important income source for both fishermen and their families. And of course, it's we thinking about the, pro the process for human slaughter, uh, the methods used for, for killing uh, Pirarucu uh, doesn't meet any uh, prescription of human slaughter process. For example, uh, as in, in some industries, the fish is put in water and ice shilling but we know that uh, for some studies that the animal uh, is not uh, in consciousness with this method um, for the reason uh, the animal is in suffering during a time of killing. And this, uh, uh, this kind of methods of, of killing uh, doesn't agree with the recommendations from the World Organization for Animal Health because the animal uh, needs to be stunned before the killing. And this is the regulation in Brazil because uh, we have the animals for human consumption and we don't have the fish, but we have the definition of fish, but it's just related with amphibians and reptiles. So it is really contradictory the, the normative in Brazil and, and the, this normative was related uh, the last year and is passed away right now. But um, uh, some progress is starting. Um, in the last three months, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture released three manuals for good practice for, for, for production of, of fish and also good practice for the transport and good practice for human slaughter. 
but it's just that, just manuals, recommendations. And as I told you, uh, the animal um, received ne, or is it stunned because we don't know with a blow to the head uh, with an artisanal tool, uh, generally for uh, a wood from the river. And just for, uh, after all that, the animal is bleeding uh, for the cut of the big um, arteries. And of course, we know that uh, uh, a kind of fish with uh, that size needs a lot of energy in the bowl for the head to, to be an uh, effective stunning. And of course, this is not the case. And you can see here the, the um, the cranium of the Pirarupu, you have probably three or four centimeters of bond to, uh, to protect the brain. So you need a lot of energy and uh, cinetic energy to, to, to have a effective stunning. And uh, the idea for, for my project is uh, to develop a gun uh, suitable for the use in fish. Uh, similar to this, but of course we need some uh, modification because of course uh, the fisherman uh, doesn't have any, any a compressor, a compressor or energy or other kind of thing. So for the reason, the principal aim of my project is to design and develop a gun for stoning and killing Piralucu in the state of Amazonas in Brazil. And the idea is also uh, to conduct training sessions in human slaughter uh, f uh, of fish, fish sentence as fish pain for the fishermen. And the idea is to conduct these training sessions uh, uh, for the correct use of the guns for human slaughter for the fishermen and other technicians. Uh, the budget of my project is really simple because it's, uh, I don't have, for now, I don't have any, any, uh, any intention of uh, profit. So uh, I, I just, I, I calculate the, the, the price of the guns for uh, uh, stoning and killing, the travel expenses for the, for the training stations, and of course the, the shipping of guns for the fishermen. The, this this uh, price is in the USA dollar. And I expect to deliver some technology and training for artisan fishermen and to integrate the fishermen and their families with sustainable uh, development aiming one welfare. And of course, also reduce the suffering of Pirarucu at the time of killing. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, you have my contact here if you want to um, make me any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. This is really interesting presentation and we already have some questions, but as I said, let's just uh, hear from Anna and our last panelist for today and dive into the questions. So Anna, okay. over to you. Hello. Hello, how are you? It's a great pleasure to be here today and be able to share with us our experience regarding um, the first octopus farm that uh, intends to be established in Spain. So now I'm going to share my screen with all of you and I'll start with my presentation. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'll try to be as uh, short as possible. Uh, okay, so I share my screen here. Okay, so sorry, I'm not so okay, Let me see. Okay, uh -huh. okay, is it okay like this? 
Cass? I think we can see, but maybe cut off. Maybe if you... Something like that. Okay. I okay, think it should work. good. I think it should work, yeah. So, as I was telling you, uh, 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 well, I, first of all, I'm Ana Bejar. I'm from the Spanish uh, Political Party for Animals, PACMA. Uh, I'm a member of the board of directors. And um, um, I was in this project, PACMA, when, when, we, when we heard about this octopus farm trying to be settled in, in, in Spain, in the, in the Canary Islands, uh, we started to, to work against it uh, with all our means. So, um, okay, this is what I'm going to, to talk you about. Uh, briefly, as I told you, but uh, I'll try to explain to you all the steps we've been taking against this farm, this first farm in history. Uh, that's the, the main issue here. I mean, it's not just the, that they want to install a farm, but it, it is going to be the first as a model to reproduce this many times. So this is really a... a uh, an, an opportunity to, to fight as strong as possible against it, because it, it, it is the, the beginning of a hell for octopuses. So, okay, so uh, first I'm going to explain about the, the farm project and the company that is trying to, to do this. Uh, then uh, I'm going to talk about the sentience uh, the capability of, of, of feel, of feel and, and, and feel pain, etc. As my previous colleague Daniel explained to you, then uh, the, the the problems with environment, what it means to environmentally speaking, all the dangers, and then uh, the the actions that PACMA has taken, uh, demonstrations. Uh, the legal case we are we are um, working and and then uh, well uh, uh, the last thing we 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 did many organizations uh, for um, calling on Europe to stop this so the project well the project is as I told you the first octopus farm in the world uh, it, it is uh, intended to be started this year although we are uh, getting uh, like a, a, a slowly slowly approaching to the end of the year and we haven't uh, had we know they don't have all the permits so far we think but it's been very difficult to to really know because this is a, a you know Nueva Pescanova is a big big company uh, they sell products a product portfolio of fish in 80 countries and as you can imagine, they have uh, a lot of power and they have just purchased this captive breeding patent. Um, for example, in northern Spain, uh, uh, the, consume, the, the consumption and also the production of octopus, it's been going on for decades and, and centuries because it's a traditional thing to eat. Uh, and we know that uh, fishermen uh, have their own kind of industry about it with some pots where they uh, they were feeding the, 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 the octopuses. But this is a complete, uh, uh, this um, a model that they want to install in, in the Canary Islands. It's a huge, giant uh, business. This is Five, uh, 560,000 square feet in a closer space uh, at the, in the Canary Islands. And they say that this project is included in the company's sustainable strategy, okay? And of course, it's a multi-million dollar investment. It's a big, big business here. And well, the processing of the, the licenses are underway, right? And now, octopuses are intelligent, sentient, and complex, as many scientists have proved so far. We, uh, I have to say that we have been supported by many, many important uh, uh, scientists all over the world. And we even had, I don't know, like video recordings from Peter Singer, from Peter Godfrey Smith, 
many, many people saying, hey, please, uh, um, uh, grabbing attention about what these animals, how these animals are and they feel, etc. They have per perceptual ability, feel pain, have emotional re responses and long-term memory and complex cognition. They, 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 they need a lot of stimuli around them because they are very, uh, they are very, um, they're very intelligent. So they need to be, to be, to, to feel alive with all these stimuli around. They are not animals to be kept in, inside a, a tank. They are also very solitary animals, okay? And farming them, what the scientists say is that farming them would um, de develop into cannibalism because they are not, uh, uh, they are not um, uh, used to be together. Okay, um, there is a, the 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 doctora, Doctor Elena Lara from Compassion in Wolf Farming. She's she's the research director. Said that they are very intelligent, very uh, and also solitary. And as I was saying these kinds of farms would seriously affect their overall development and well-being, okay? And uh, to be confined is really, really against their way, uh, psychologically, the, 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 the way they can really uh, uh, bear or, or, or live under this, these uh, circumstances. And she also said, uh, in a very uh, uh, recommendable, advisable uh, book to read, Intensive Octopus Farming, A Recipe for Disaster, she points out that uh, there is no legislation uh, to protect these animals. And uh, if we don't do something about it, they, you know, they are uh, unprotected, totally unprotected. And that's why we need to be so strong against it because there are no laws regulating this. There's another uh, scientist, Dr. Jennifer Mather, Mather from the uh, Lethbridge University that says that intensive husbandry systems are inevitably hostile to the positive experiences that octopuses are prone to seek, including high levels of cognitive a stimulation again this a stimuli that they need so much to grow to develop and to live a normal life for them now environmentally wise well um we don't really know how far the damage would would be because uh we don't have previous experiences about a, a, a an octopus farm so, but we can imagine, we can, we can uh, get some, some figures and some uh, ideas about how huge the environment is going to be damaged because, because octopus are carnivorous animals that would need to be fed with huge amounts of human edible fish products just to be alive. And to produce one kilo of octopus meat, three kilos of marine life would be needed as feed, leading to more overfishing and pressure on other marine environments. So it's really, um, it's really worrying. Then again, we don't know the, 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 um, the uh, consequences because we, we don't have any other farm like this before. And um, the, the, the environmentalists say that uh, the fast implementation of a project of this magnitude could lead to irreparable damage, destruction of the coastline, fauna, vegetation, and also sectors for the Canary Islands as tourism, environment, and also potentially to human health. We'll speak about that later, about antibiotics uh, discharge into the sea, etc. What we know is that today we are aware of the serious environmental damage caused by aquaculture and fish farming, including the dumping of waste and antibiotics. 
Between 20% and 25% of the fish caught are used to make fish meal and fish oil for farmed fish. Octopuses are carnivores, so far Mindanao in captivity would contribute to overfishing. Now, how about uh, regulations, envir environmental regulations? Well, our problem when building the legal case is that um, as animals, they are not uh, protected by any law at a Spanish level, European level. So we had to uh, get a closer look about environmental laws, regulations. Then we have here that octopus farming is in direct conflict with the strategies uh, the, proposed by the European Commission for sustainable food production in order to contribute to the European Green Deal. They say that these strategic guidelines for a more sustainable and competitive uh, European Union aquaculture for the period of 2021-2030 is to promote the diversification of aquaculture in the EU, uh, European Union, especially to lower trophic species with a lower environmental footprint. And this is high environmental footprint. So it's against uh, European policies. They also stress that they need to ensure sustainable feed system, limiting feed producers' reliance on fish meal. So clearly it's against Europe guidelines. Well, we started uh, with a big demonstration in the Canary Islands. Um, with uh, along with um, signatures and support from 60 international animal protection organizations. We started with this uh, big demonstration. And um, also later, uh, because our first demonstration was in February and then later April, we uh, gathered thousands of animal rights activists all around the world because we started with the first demonstration in, in Spain, but then we uh, call on uh, many, many other um, organizations, international ones, and we finally achieved to celebrate a demonstration in uh, 30 cities, 30 cities around the world. And it was a big, big event. It was covered, uh, we gained a lot of uh, attention from the press, from the media, and it was really powerful. It was really powerful. We were very, very happy because we really um, gathered uh, um, people around and, 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 and raised awareness uh, among the people that are not very, you know, with this aspicism or aspicist uh, world we are in, People don't uh, identify octopuses as animals with rights. <laughs> so uh, this was a good educational thing. Um, yeah, we were very Anna? grateful. Yes. So, sorry, I don't want to uh, interrupt you. Just a warning, just a couple of minutes left because I wanted okay, to leave some time you. for Q&A. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> It's just, okay, a couple of minutes. Well, then, uh, 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 besides the demonstrations, we've been working with a legal department in PACMA, uh, legally wise, we've been building a case, and uh, the most appropriate way to start fighting against uh, these farms, legally speaking, is to go uh, and to focus our attention into environmental issues, uh, and um, my, uh, our allegations were made because uh, we know that uh, they they are they going to exceed the permit um, to dump waste into the sea. So, um, but unfortunately, the government of the Canary Islands determined that there are no grounds for, re for refusing the authorization for these charges into the sea. So it's been really, really difficult to build a case, a powerful legal case, and to, you know, to, to fight against all these uh, permitting procedures, et cetera. So um, 
because the Canary Islands have given the green light to the project. They say that there is no danger for the ecosystem. They say that everything is perfect, no problem. And then the last thing, I know that I'm just half, half a minute. Uh, well, we just uh, signed a letter, uh, many, many NGOs united again uh, to call for a EU, EU ban because we certainly need uh, the, the help of, uh, of Europe. Otherwise, um, we, 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 we won't be able to, to stop this. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. And of course, any questions that might arise, uh, I'm here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And this is really very interesting also on a personal basis, but I'm sure we'll get to talk to more, uh, more about this. Um, thank you so much also for uh, wrapping up the presentation. I just wanted to have a little bit of time before we dive into our next session um, because we received some interesting questions. Um, so I'll just go ahead, uh, bear with me. I actually have a question that could be linked for all our panelists because you, the three of you in very different settings, but you all highlighted humane slaughter as a common issue, you know, in Turkey for a specific fish or for octopus. So I was wondering if, and this is the question for all of you, so whoever wants to reply, do you think this is because of a lack of research in um, alternative humane slaughter methods or do you think it's more a matter of we have the knowledge it's just difficult to implement it may i start of course um i was searching for the answer for the same question and the feedback i got from the sector was some of the farmers believe the owner of the farmers believe that there's a limit to harvesting with those machines and it's very high uh, high the law from what they want to achieve within, within a day. Um, so because of the harvest limit, they were not, uh, they didn't want to use machines. But when I talk with the companies that sells the machine itself, they say that there is no limit regarding it. So maybe there is a miscommunication regarding the subject. So that was like one of the few things that was very common from uh, the farmers for the reason. And the other reason was, of course, uh, they were not uh, open to implementing new technologies because um, they, they didn't see any example and they don't know how it works and if it's good for them or not. So I think raising awareness uh, could be one of the solutions, but also uh, and also um, clarifying some miscommunication regarding the machine, I believe. Yeah, do any of the others want to join? in? Yeah, just for complimenting, uh, I think that in Brazil is the overlapping of two things, the lack of insurance for the part of industry, because the industry of nighty lap in Brazil is really, really big. Uh, I think that Brazil is the, the fourth country in the world for the production of tilapia but the industry don't have any interest in, in implementing human slaughter methods. Why? Because it's, it's expensive and they don't have any pressure from the, for the public, unfortunately. In the case of the pirarucu, of the kind specifically species, I think this is, there is not any, any, any information about the percussion, the, the efficiency about the percussion, for example, for for per, for stunning and killing, and um, for the reason I think is the overlapping. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Uh, I totally agree. Sometimes uh, there is a lack of knowledge. Probably in the case of octopus, we actually don't know still a lot of elements. But actually for what you and Denise uh, mentioned, we might have the knowledge, but we might lack on the actual action. So the enforcement of these uh, machines. So um, I have one uh, question for all of you. And it's a general question, which I really like from the audience, like how can activists in the space of animal welfare in aquaculture support your specific work. 
So Denise, I'll, I'll turn to you and then we can move forward. Um, we, if, it's a, if this person is from another country, I'd like to uh, communicate and try to see ways that what is happening in their country so that we can collaborate on an international level to create that demand we're seeking for from the uh, exporty countries. So that could be one of the way that can, they can support us. Uh, we haven't published our project on online yet, but once we do, uh, of course, sharing what we're doing or like if they have any contact that they can share with us, that will be a huge support. And just even like co communicating with us itself is just very enlightening and very supportive, I guess. Thank you for this beautiful question. Thank uh, you. Yeah. That's, sorry, sorry. Anna, no, no, it's please. all right, it's all right. Well, mine is very, very short. It's just that uh, we need help in so many ways. Uh, we are just a very, very humble political party and we don't get any uh, fundings from the administration. So we really, for example, a big, big help for us is some funding, like some donations. And also, of course, collaborating in many ways, like, I don't know, discussing legal aspects to fight against this kind of industry, um, collaborating in many ways with your knowledge, with, uh, with knowledge of other, other NGOs and also donations <laughs> to carry on working. That's, that's all, thank you. Okay, yes, in, in my case, I um, stimulate some NGOs in Brazil to work in, with uh, aquatic animals, specifically with uh, night tilapia. And I think that some some own ONGOs they are trying uh, uh, funding from the open philanthropy and other kind of international uh, funding for for campaigns and activities and other kind of things. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining us in this panel for your presentations. Um, as uh, I'm sorry if some of the questions were not answered, but all our three panelists were kind enough to say that you can reach out to them if you have anything more uh, you're curious about. So thank you so much for joining from the audience as well before um, leaving you and uh, starting our next session in about seven minutes. Let me just uh, remind you, I'll um, take on from what Anna's was presenting. We are also, we're developing a focus group within the uh, Aquatic Life Institute. It will be uh, on aquatic animal policy initiatives and we will be engaging with this octopus issue, let's call it that way. So definitely something interesting. Yes, if you are interested in this type of work, send me uh, an email and we'll follow up with next steps. Um, another thing, uh, we as of the Aquatic Life Institute will be present at COP27, so the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, to again highlight the link uh, between aquatic animal welfare, sustainability and climate change. So we would really appreciate if you could help um, support and share our social media of the event when we will be there to just be let us be more um, effective for aquatic animals. Okay, thank you so much again. The next session will begin in five minutes. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Steve. Bye. Thank you, bye. bye.